so this assignment is definitely my favorite story of the entire year and it comes as one of the last assignments of the year um, the action and, ev and events of this um, part of our history really plays out almost like a Hollywood movie um, it's a long assignment like I said I'm gonna read the sections to you um, stop it so you can fill it out so it'll go pretty quick and trust me you'll like the story enough where it'll go by much faster than maybe a lot of my other assignments um, so if you have any questions as always go ahead and contact me on Big Blue Button um, but I promise you stick with me you will love this story and that is the story of Abraham Lincoln's assassination um, right at the end of the Civil War so if you want to just tackle this on your own feel free you can go ahead and, and stop me now if once again, if you want me to read it to you, then just stay on the line, and we will um, go through it now together. The Lincoln Assassination The Civil War had not been going well for the Confederate States of America for some time. John Wilkes Booth, a well-known Maryland actor, was upset by this because he was a Confederate sympathizer. He gathered a group of friends and hatched a devious plan as early as March 1865 while staying at the boarding house of a woman named Mary Surratt. Upon the group learning that Lincoln was to attend Laura Keene's acclaimed performance of Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. on April 14th, Booth revised his mastermind plan. However, it still included the simultaneous assassination of Lincoln, Vice President Andrew Johnson, and Secretary of State William H. Seward. By murdering the president, and two of his possible successors, Booth and his co-conspirators hoped to throw the U.S. government into disarray. Go ahead and pause, answer those questions. All right, next, John Wilkes Booth had acted in several performances at Ford's Theater. He knew the layout of the theater and the backstage exits. Booth was the ideal assassin in this location. Vice President Andrew Johnson was at a local hotel that night, and Secretary of State William Seward was at home, ill and recovering from an injury. Both locations had been scouted, and the plan was ready to be put into action. Go ahead and pause. All right, next slide. Lincoln occupied a private box above the stage with his wife Mary, a young officer named Henry Rathbone and Rathbone's fiancee, Clara Harris, the daughter of a New York senator. The Lincolns arrived late for the comedy, but the president was reportedly in a fine mood and laughed heartedly during the production. At 10.15 p.m., Lincoln's guards stepped away and Booth slipped into the box and fired his 44 caliber single-shot Derringer into the back of Lincoln's head. After stabbing Rathbone, who immediately rushed at him, Booth leapt onto the stage and shouted, Sic Semper Tyrannis, meaning thus ever to tyrants, the Virginia State motto. At first, the crowd interpreted the unfolding drama as part of the production, but a scream from the First Lady told them otherwise. Although Booth broke his leg in the fall, he managed to leave the theater and escape from Washington, D.C. on horseback. His knowledge of the theater a layout proved useful in his escape. Go ahead and hit pause. Okay, next it says, a 33-year-old doctor named Charles Leal was in the audience and hastened to the presidential box. Immediately upon learning the shot, hearing the shot, and uh, Mary Lincoln's scream, he found the president slumped in his chair, paralyzed and struggling to breathe. Several soldiers carried Lincoln to a house across the street and placed him on a bed. When the Surgeon General arrived at the house, he concluded that Lincoln could not be saved and that he would die during the night. The Vice President Andrew Johnson, members of Lincoln's cabinet, and several of the President's closest friends stood vigil by Lincoln's bedside until he was officially pronounced dead at 7.22 a.m. on April 15th. The First Lady lay on an adjoining bed um, with her eldest son, Robert, at her side, overwhelmed with shock and grief. Go ahead and fill that slide out. Okay, next slide. It says, earlier that night, around 10.30 p.m. on April 14th, one of Booth's fellow conspirators, Lewis Powell, entered the home of Secretary of State William Seward. 
He was let in under the ruse that he was a local doctor and was there to care for his patient. Seward had, be had been injured in a carriage accident days before and suffered a concussion, broken jaw, and broken right arm. As he walked upstairs into his room, Seward's son Frederick noticed him. After Frederick ordered him to stop, Powell darted into the secretary's room and proceeded to stab Seward several times in the face and neck. After a hand-to-hand -hand fight with Seward's son, Powell rushes out of the house and later is arrested back at Mary Surratt's boarding house. Seward is left in his bed bleeding and scarred, but survives, partially because of the neck brace he was wearing. Answer that question and hit pause. Okay, the third part of the plot involved the vice president. Andrew Johnson was staying at a nearby hotel. On the morning, on that morning, George Azarat booked room 126 at the same hotel. However, he could not muster the courage to kill Johnson, so he began drinking at the hotel bar as early as 8 p.m. to calm his nerves. He presumably got drunk and spent the night wandering drunk around the streets of Washington. Later that night, Johnson awoke and was informed of Lincoln's shooting. He went to be by the president's side, unknown to him that his own life was in jeopardy earlier that evening. During his stay at the hotel, Azarat had asked the bartender about Johnson's whereabouts. This aroused suspicion the next day after Lincoln was assassinated. An employee of the hotel contacted the police regarding a suspicious-looking man in a gray coat. He was later apprehended and arrested. Go ahead, pause, answer those questions. Okay, so it says, by 4 uh, a.m. early in the early hours of 18, April 15, 1865, while Lincoln was barely holding on to life, Booth, now traveling with his friend David Harold, arrives at Dr. Samuel Mudd's house. Mudd, an acquaintance of Booth's, was there to set Booth's broken leg. Whether or not Mudd knew what Booth had just done remains a question for historians. By 6 p.m. that night, with his leg set, Booth and Harold push on towards the Potomac River. They plan to cross into Virginia and find a safe haven with sympathetic Southerners. Booth is shocked to learn that Southerners aren't sympathetic at all. Most are mourning what they saw as the callous murder of a great intellectual mind. It takes until April 24th for the two men to secure a boat to row across the Potomac to Virginia. This slows the men's pace and puts them behind schedule. Go ahead and answer those questions. On April 18th, Lincoln's body was carried to the Capitol Rotunda to lay in state while people paid their respects at a national funeral. On April 21st, Lincoln's body is boarded onto a train and brought to Springfield, Illinois, where he lived before becoming president. Tens of thousands of Americans lined the railroad route and saluted their fallen leader as the train's solemn progression through the North. The train stopped for funerals in Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Buffalo, Cleveland, and Chicago. He was finally laid to rest in his tomb on May 4th, 1865. Answer that question. On April 26th, Union troops surrounded the Virginia farmhouse where Booth and Harold were hiding out and set fire to it, hoping to flush the fugitives out. Harold surrendered, but Booth remained inside. As the blaze intensified, a sergeant shot Booth in the neck, allegedly because the assassin had raised his gun as if to shoot. Carried out of the building alive, he lingered for three hours before gazing at his hands and uttering his last words, useless, useless. Eight defendants stood trial for uh, President Lincoln's murder on May 12, 1865. Four were found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. The remaining four, including Samuel Mudd, were ordered to serve prison sentences at the remote Fort Jefferson in the Dry Tortugas off of Florida, a Union prison during the Civil War. Lewis Powell, David Harold, George Azarat, and Mary Surratt were hung at the old Arsenal prison in Washington, D.C. Surratt was the first woman to be put to death by the United States. The mass hanging took place on July 7, 1865, thus officially ending the Lincoln assassination saga. Well, almost. Go ahead and answer those questions. Eleven years after his death, Lincoln's body lay peacefully in his tomb. Miles away in Chicago, there was a crime boss who led a small counterfeit ring named Big Jim Kennelly. 
Ken only saw one of his best engravers sentenced to 10 years in prison. To pressure the government to release his man, Kennelly recruited two members of his gang, Terrence Mullen and Jack Hughes, to kidnap Lincoln's body. For ransom, they would demand $200,000 in cash and a full pardon for their imprisoned comrade. Under normal circumstances, this plan seemed completely foolish with little chance to succeed. However, since the Springfield, Illinois cemetery that held his tomb was known for their minimal security, they had a better than average chance of actually pulling it off. But they made a significant mistake. Neither Mullen nor Hughes had any body snatching experience. So they um, invited a man named Louis Swiggles, uh, who they thought was a grave robber to help them, but they couldn't have made a worse choice because Swiggles was a paid informant of the Secret Service. Go ahead and answer that question. On the night of the planned robbery, authorities were waiting for them at Lincoln's tomb. Hiding nearby, the police witnessed uh, the comedy of errors that soon began. Although Mullen and Hughes were career criminals, they couldn't pick a lock, so they had to cut through the padlock with a file. Once inside the tomb, they found that they couldn't not lift Lincoln's 500-pound cedar and lead coffin. The inept grave robbers were considering their options when a detective's pistol accidentally went off outside. Mullen and Hughes bolted, but it wasn't much of a getaway. They were quickly arrested back in Chicago. Answer that question. Soon after the event, Workers in the cemetery began to fear. If unlucky amateurs could come so close to carrying off Lincoln's body, what would happen if professional body snatchers targeted the tomb? The only solution caretakers could think of was to hide the body where no one could find it. So after dark, six cemetery employees buried Lincoln in a shallow, unmarked grave in the tomb's basement. The men swore to never reveal the location of the president's body, and in the years that followed, they kept that secret faithfully. In 1900, it became clear that the tomb was not built correctly and was in need of repair. When construction began, they realized the tomb was empty, and after a panicked search, they found the coffin in the basement. In order to positively identify the casket, Lincoln's wife and son were there too. It had to be opened. 23 people looked into the open casket, and all 23 agreed that the chalky white face with coarse, thick hair was that of President Lincoln. Lincoln's surviving son was very unhappy when he learned of the opening of the casket. At his request, Lincoln's body was placed in a steel cage, lowered into a 10-foot deep vault, and buried under tons of wet concrete. He is still there, in his tomb, never to be disturbed again. Go ahead, guys, answer those um, questions that are there, and make sure we do the timeline at the end as well. Um, you're just going to pull out eight different events. There's actually plenty of them, um, so it shouldn't be really an issue. Um, any eight events, fill that timeline out, and then go ahead and hit submit. Told you it was a good story. Um, if you have any questions or anything, just contact me on Big Blue Button. I'll be there.